All right, I believe we are live on Facebook. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sandy Anone, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, joining you today from Olympia, Washington. I have chosen today to wear my white and, um, and also wear my suffrage hat given to me by um, one of the Cultivating Voices Live members, uh, Silvia Ramos Cruz uh, from Albuquerque, who was part of our August Votes for Women suffrage event that we had um, in honor of the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. So I wanted to wear my hat and, uh, and I wanted to wear my white, just as I saw uh, Kamala Harris do last night, where she talked about the significance of her win um, in US politics, a uh, long time coming and, and that that, that glass ceiling um, being uh, shattered through for the first time, but as she so, so very, very uh, clearly stated, not the last time. So I'm very, very glad to be with everyone here. Um, uh, we have folks from across the United States and coming to us from different parts of the, different parts of the world across time zones. I want to, um, I won't, I won't say much more other than to say I am, I'm, I have such a sense of relief and jubilation and yet there's so much work to still be done, not just on behalf of, of US citizens, but of course, we're part of a global network and, um, and I believe now that we will be able to better fulfill, uh, hopefully better fulfill our responsibility to be um, global citizens and, and, and connect with um, people and governments from across, uh, from across the globe. So I'm all the more reason I'm so glad to um, welcome voices from outside of the United States for our post-election open mic. Um, it's, safe, it's safe for me to say, I will never forget where I was when I heard um, the news that uh, the electoral college count had flipped over. In fact, I was at a global poetry event um, reading uh, in 100,000 Poets for Change that was originating out of Toronto, Canada, um, organized by one of the Cultivating Voices Live poetry members, um, Archna Sarni, Sarni from, um, who, who it was origin, she's in India, but she's from Toronto. And so, um, I was with folks across 11 time zones um, in a poetry reading that was extraordinary that is available for your viewing on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Uh, so the, 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 the sense of the strength of what poetry has meant during the pandemic and through the elections um, here for me in the United States is never more palpable, uh, has never been more palpable than um, to how I feel today to be with all of you. Well, folks, those of you watching us in Facebook Live uh, here on this uh, Sunday here in uh, uh, Sunday afternoon in the Pacific Northwest um, where I am, those of you watching, um, we, our format is this. We have a uh, wonderful, wonderful parade of poets uh, that will be each reading one poem up to three minutes each. They'll be introducing themselves. Um, I will just be saying their name and encouraging them to read their piece and introduce themselves. And we will um, have quite a rainbow of poetry um, uh, this day, this evening, depending on where you are watching. Uh, and I'm so grateful to all the poets for signing up and spending part of their time today with us. Um, on uh, what continues to be, you know, I, I'm feeling quite uh, a still sense of joy and, and lift. Uh, as I said, I'm wearing my Kamala White, Kamala Harris white shirt uh, as she did last night. So um, our first, so I'm gonna cut right to the chase and uh, go to our first reader for today. And uh, uh, I'm so, I was so excited to see, um, uh, that Diane Leo Omnin, Omnin, 
Alminen had signed up because Diane and I go way back. Uh, so welcome, Diane. And Kate Claire Wegerson will be next. Thank you, Sandy, and also Elizabeth, and also Dawn. And I don't know if I'm forgetting anyone else for making this all happen. November 7th, I want to celebrate, but there's still work to be done. The proud boy sized Trump banners, you might say Halloween decorations staked in lawns just around the corner, though they disappeared promptly November 4th. Still sober reminders that I'm no longer in San Francisco. How do I make eye contact as a person of color and a woman visibly non-white immigrant descendant? I can't even go grocery shopping without them, falsely assuming that English isn't my first language. How can you look me in the eye but vote against me? Worse, the spitting and sputtering to go back to where I came from, that I am the Chinese virus, the Kung flu, racist diatribes spewed from a so-called leader and violence not reported by the news. I called my mom simply to ask, is it too much to want and fight for equality for all marginalized people, for black and indigenous and trans and disabled lives, for the 235,000 lives lost in this country? Does that make me the radical left? She said, no. Then, remembering Kamala without a beat, insist, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, is just enough to keep me going. Ladies, wear your shoes, the glass is everywhere. Thank you so much, Diane. and. Um for also reminding us specifically of all the different peoples impacted. Um, and, 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 and we, the work that we have to do with and for each other. Uh, and thank you for reminding us that as the first reader in, in your continued call for action. Uh, next we have Kate Claire Wegerson and Following Kate will be Lori DeRosiers. May I study the magnificence of living on this planet as poet. Inspired by each person spiraling through all they have learned, carrying the passion for peace. My poem today is Everywhere We Rise. The epigraph is for Angelica Das, Brazilian photographer, sociological researcher who traveled the world as founder of Humane. 4,000 portraits she paired with the pixels of the Pantone of the human race. Everywhere we rise. We lift the veil century by century, no longer blind to bias, the root of suppression. We rise to reject the cruelty of people for property indentured to poverty. We are done with the reign of tyrants raging in armies or in communities with vulgarity. We now as seekers for humanity outpace the tormentors of caustic infliction. We support <laughs> the sovereignty of matriarchal equality where power mongrels separate and divide with lies. We march for justice and freedom for all. We are not shells to be tossed to the sea. Our worthiness reacquaints our likeness. We turn the tide. We are the art of skin color, 
2000 in the Pantone Library. We now are indebted to acknowledge 4,000 by Umane researcher Angelica Doss. We no longer pen in pseudonym. We thrive with education, giving us voice without retribution. We broadcast through ley lines worldwide. We build bridges continent to continent for all people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. We build bridges, continent to continent, people to people. Mm. Our next poet is Lori DeRosiers, hello. And following Lori will be Katie McElroy. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, good to see you. I, uh, uh, wait, I'm trying to pull up. I'm debating between two poems. It's a hard one. Um, I, I'm reading a poem I wrote during uh, the pandemic. Um, it's called Two Days Before. It's a prose piece, really, a prose poem. The field was vast and greener than green, resembling a meadow I remember from childhood with peach and apple trees and a grapevine and four does crossing in the mist because there had to be mist to be deer and raspberry bushes or were they blackberries? Yes, and there was my little brother at two holding the croquet mallet he poked me with just below the eye, and I bled and was afraid, but was fine after that, and he was laughing and crying too, and my mother and father were alive again, so young and lovely, mom in her shorts and summer button-down shirt, dad in a polo and jeans, and they were smiling and happy before the divorce, and my brother is still crying because he doesn't remember them happy, but it's okay because I do. And we talk every day since mom died. Dad died years ago from brain cancer. We saw him two days before, which was Christmas, at his home in Reading. He couldn't speak or move his body anymore, but held our hands for a long time. And I felt his spirit still there. And the field was greener than green and vast. Oh, those endings, and the field was greener than green and vast. Hmm. I feel that sense of opening. Thank you so much. Hmm. Katie McElroy is next, followed by Dawood Phillip. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I just... I wanted to share a poem that I wrote not so long ago, obviously before the election happened to, and um, obviously the tension and anxiety in America has, you know, gone beyond the borders of the country. And I think everyone has been holding their breath for a while. And I think that's kind of the feeling that this poem is supposed to encapsulate. So I can't move on that fast, like I do from line to line. I always get stuck on that thing, like those letter magnets arranged on our fridge, a particularly weak M sliding down past an Aurora Borealis bottle opener, perfect plastic spider descending from a thread, legs arched, death position, moon landing. And just before it hits the floor, I slide it back up with a relentless thumb double the speed and half the drama, up to the heavens, off-white, 
Then one day I find her with a vacuum and wake up in a cold sweat. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us from afar late in the evening. And uh, always wonderful to hear, you, hear your voice. Dewad Philip is next and followed by John Roach. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I'm reading a poem from my new book, uh, City Twilight. It's available on Amazon. It's Anaphora Press out of Texas. And, and it's an elegy for my sister-in-law. Uh, and it was a day before the lockdown came with the corona and it's called a funeral before COVID-19. How quickly it all changed and changing still by the hour, by the day, in the blink of an eye. We hit the ground running, no time to grieve over love, holiday pastels, no pause or tear over the suddenness of your passing. You'd hardly recognize this world you left behind, this war against a cunning enemy, against the clock, a rising curve, free falling market, I think of you, your bittersweet home going as the last we'd see, dignified in old customs, filling adjoining chapels, the new dead are zipped in body bags, blue lights flashing ahead of as loaded 16 wheelers speed away. We mourn on Instagram, sing hymns and sankeys in measured distance, obituaries more and more familiar, every hour someone you know, and quarantine a viral leash to wear and isolate. Old men like me understand it has to do with beds, masks, respirators, expediencies, politics, and profit. We watch Overworked medics lead the charge and workers look death in the eye and resist. We get it that the earth paused and dolphins returned and an army of toads come hopping in the moonlight outside my door. It all happened quickly, your passing, this crazed beast that for a moment feels like any ordinary Sunday my neighbor revving his engine as he listens for the timing in the carburetor. There's no place to go, I tell him. You wake one morning and a hospital has mushroomed in the middle of the meadow, a new city of tents and incubators, waiting trailers parked in the shade of maples. There is no procession for the new dead, no three-cornered cheese paste, sandwiches and rosaries, no wondering what dress to wear, to say, to sing, time to wander, grieve. You may not recognize these random concerns in the margins of a journal someone will keep. The noise of a large bird with strong talons clawing on the roof. I come out in time to see the length of its tail, a large hawk as it flapped its powerful wings and soared away. Thank you so much. Ooh. What a beautiful reading, Dawad. Thank you for joining us from Trinidad, as you shared with us. Although you're originating from New York, you, you are normally with us in New York. And I look forward to the next time you'll be reading with us. And you're muted. <laughs> Feel free to unmute. <laughs> next, 
we have. Um, and I'll also say, you know, amidst the celebration, we are still in this pandemic and we still, um, we're still enduring much. And uh, I appreciate the reminder of the of the losses that 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 we are carrying with us as well. So thank you. Well, John Roach is up now, and following John will be Bill Nevins. John. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, John Roach from uh, Placidas, New Mexico, uh, representing Jules Poetry Playhouse and Poetry Playhouse Publications. Uh, quick plug, uh, we did an anthology series called the Poets Speak series recent last couple of years. This is called Trumped, the first one. And um, uh, I posted a poem each day for 60 days before the election from that series mm -hmm. and if you go to Facebook, the Poets Speak Anthology page, you'll see all those poems. Okay, so uh, this one is one I wrote on 29 October of this year and it's called Blue Moon. Once in a blue moon, there's a chance to bring real change to this country. Once in a blue moon, 77 million Americans have already voted with five days to go. 100 million Americans could vote early. All counted an unprecedented 150 Americans could vote. Once in a blue moon, we could do more than remove the wannabe tyrant, more than deal with the disastrous mess he's left. More than, be to, more than begin to tackle these severe health, jobs, refugee, and climate emergencies, more than restore the broken federal agencies, more than punish the perpetrators of the recent Ponzi scheme, more than create a national election system that makes voting easy and safe, more than restore our re respect around the world, more than restore balance to the courts with judges who believe in justice for all and not just the 1%. Once in a blue moon, there's a chance to do something, really do something about the fundamental economic, racial, and gender-based inequalities that led us to this piss-poor predicament. I'll remember that day well. John, here's the moon for you. <laughs> Thank you, John Roach. And up next is Bill Nevins, followed by Harvey Sos or Sauce. I'm not entirely sure. I'm so I please help me pronounce your name when you're up, and I'll remember it forever. Hey y'all. It's great to be here and Sandy and Elizabeth, thank you so much for doing this. Um, my name is Bill Nevins, uh, and uh, I've got two books. Uh, you can find them on Amazon of poetry. And then I'm also in the uh, Revolutionary Poets Brigade anthology, which just came out. It's called Building Socialism. You can also find that uh, out there. Uh, we've been uh, semi-isolated here in our uh, New Mexico mountain cabin since uh, early April because of the COVID-19. Uh, we're doing fine, we don't go out much, but it's beautiful here. But um, a few weeks ago, we looked up at the mountain ridge near where we live um, and we saw huge flames leaping up into the night sky. Uh, our friends in Colorado recognize what that means. Um, the, the forest fire was fought by a small army of really brave firefighters with helicopters and all. And um, a heavy snowfall brought the fire under control, but it was a close call, uh, not unlike this past week's election. Um, so this poem I think came out of it and it is called The Firewall. Um, there's an epigraph from uh, a song by Nick Cave called Ghostine Speaks, which goes, my friends have gathered here for me. 
I think they're singing to be free. The firewall. Flames broke the ridge line just the other day, Saturday. I would leap skydive if I could. And now the winds whirl screaming so near to Hollow's Eve. We ran away, but daren't leave, for this place is where we need be. If any dead sons, parachutes reversed, raise their voices up from those stark caskets, urns, and dust, from the iron stars and sleeping rust to sing to you, to me. If any dead hearts should beat, should burn, if there is any new truth we live to learn, curious as any mountain cat, if any horseman head in hand does not pass but pauses to listen, speak, draw near, to see what revealing blaze may vault that smoking ridge. Thank you. Yes, the fires um, have been burning for a long time. And uh, I'm hopeful now that we will have a little more attention. It's long, long overdue and perhaps a little too late for climate change. Um, but your poem reminds us of the necessity to pay attention as, as we've watched so many areas of the globe be under siege from fire and other natural causes. Thank you, Bill Nevins. Always, always. Thank you. And next, I'm so excited to welcome uh, a first time reader to Cultivating Voices, I believe, uh, Harvey. Uh, uh, sauce. Sauce. sauce, there you go. <laughs> sauce, indeed, I got it. I will never forget Harvey. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they said, that the way they pronounced it when they cut it short from the Russian. So, you know, uh, generations ago. Um, but uh, yeah, my name is Harvey Sauce. I host uh, an open mic also generally every third Saturday. It's called Artful Dodgers Poetry. Uh, the room that you see pictured behind me is the room that I generally use there. It was uh, built in 1891 after a Venetian palazzo uh, and hopefully we'll get back to it. But right now we're doing virtual readings. So uh, I posted in an invitation to all of you to join us next Saturday the 14th at 4 p.m. New York time is our next reading which will feature a, a Russian poet, Gina Gruz, uh, also not her full name, <laughs> with the English translations also being read by uh, Anton Yakovlev, um, who's a poet of some interest in, in his own right. Uh, the poem I'm going to read, I wanted to read a pandemic poem, but I figured it'd probably be two minutes too long. So uh, I'll read uh, something else that I wrote. Uh, if I can get to it, if I can find it wants to hide itself. Uh, give me just a moment if I may. I don't know where it went. Um, let's see, oh, there it is, okay. Uh, I should note that when I'm not doing this, uh, although I'm mostly retired, I'm a criminal attorney. Uh, and the poem references a, a relatively new uh, program adopted by several courts uh, including the one that I work in, um, which uh, separates out cases involving veterans, returning veterans. They call the veterans courts. Uh, so that uh, is what I'm referencing here. Get with the program, 
why don't you? It wasn't with a reference to Ra, the Egyptian sun god, that the judge, the veteran himself with service in Vietnam, greeted the ex-Marine whose arms were laddered with needle marks. It was with the Ura of the core, incorporating the one into the many, that this 70-something presented a certificate of completion to some mother's son whose Uncle Sam could now be proud of him. The courtroom lit up with that same pride returning to the young man's face, 18 to 24 months in an addiction treatment program, rivaling the difficulty of any basic training course he'd ever slogged through at Camp Lejeune, the Marine Corps' North Carolina training base. Our graduate, no longer a defendant, having pulled himself up out of the mud of joblessness, helplessness, defendants, with the court's help in mind. Is his court appointed attorney. I came to view these veterans courts as the best thing about our criminal justice system. My 20 something client facing two to four, a perfect example of how well it could work. It was enough to bring tears to a hardened war resistor's eyes with even a bit of metal envy spotting the ribbons on that swelling chest. After he and the judge had saluted each other it was over case dismissed. I could see other veterans whose cases were calendared that day nodding to themselves, perhaps thinking this could work for me, buying in, or almost, several of them wearing long sleeve shirts to hide injection sites. All ranks, services, and substances were represented, soldiers, sailors, marines, heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, that few needle marks appeared fresh to staffers, was taken as a sign of acceptance, a future readiness for the resurrected life. Thank you. And come join us. Um, sauce, thank you so much. And a beautiful venue you have there. And we're so glad to have you read for your first time here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry, uh, and look forward to connecting our reading series. Uh, you know, uh, you, yeah. We're, we're only a click away from each other. Absolutely. So thank you for inviting us. And uh, I'm actually, me personally, I'm hoping I can attend that reading next Saturday. So by all, by all means, yeah. actually, we have a full yeah. empty room in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a gorgeous place. So it's, you know, one of these days I'm gonna do it? I'll I'll do both an on-site reading with a virtual component so people from uh, from overseas, for instance, or elsewhere for that matter from Washington can come join us in here and be in, and, and, and be heard. Well, Harvey's um evoking the in-person reading series reminded me um, that last year, um, Cultivating Voices was an in-person reading series and it only started a year ago last um, September. And our second reading was on Veterans Day. And we had Larry Kirshner, whom many of you in the room know and have heard read before, um, who's a vet, who is among many things, also a veteran and um, a war resistor read um, on Veterans Day in our in-person venue that has since closed down um, during the pandemic. So I want to thank you, Harvey, for um, reminding us that Veterans Day is coming up as well as um, Remind, reminding me personally about that reading last year in person. My pleasure and stay well, everybody. Indeed, indeed. Our next reader is Ken Birch, my neighbor here in Olympia, Washington. And following Ken will be Don Krieger. 
Uh, hello. So what I've got this week is I work in haiku form sometimes. And this is just a short, short cycle of haiku form poems on the moment. Starting from the viewpoint of some people not on our side, the first line. Raging at the count, they see the rising totals bury their false paths. Endless were these days, time in all directions stretched. Mm. Which way ran the clock? Mm. Mm. In the half clear sky, hanging in the misting clouds, is there somewhere dawn? Mm. Far too long it was. What had been is now unknown. Who dares sing what ne what's next? Mm. Hmm. Winter calls us now, urging us towards rest, and yet still denies us sleep. And in all of this, just to stay alive, we still distance in our masks. Wow. Thank you. That's so great. Mm. Oh. I just appreciate what you do with the haiku form, Ken. Thank you. Uh, powerful cycle once again. Uh, always great to be in the company of one of my neighbors. <laughs> and at some point, I'm, one of us is going to actually have to go over to the other person's house. I think so. I, you know, I think that's a good idea. I think, and I'm comfortable with that. So that would be kind of cool to do. Um, you have the best backdrop, though. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. And next is uh, our, uh, yeah, I can't say enough about Don Krieger. As a human, as a friend that I had not known before Cultivating Voices. And um, as you all know, he does so much support for us, but you know, Don, I get these private readings from Don almost weekly and He's a tremendous, tremendous poet, and he'll also be reading in our new book showcase coming up uh, at the end of this month. So mark your calendar for November 29th. Don Krieger, and next is Marcella after Don. Thanks, Andy, and thank you, everyone. Heirs of tyranny, there are no slaves. Anyone that sets foot here becomes free. Men and women are equal before the law. Article 19, Pinochet's Constitution, 1980. The hope and promise of America's revolution died with its constitutional convention in 1789. Native people, slaves, and women were excluded from the freedoms and even acknowledgement of their existence promised in the Declaration of Independence. Both slaveholders and those sainted framers who abhorred slavery signed the Constitution to preserve their economic privilege and power and that of those like them, white men. Even Chile's brutal dictator did better. 250 years later, America remains a bastion of institutionalized white male supremacy, shameless hypocrisy, a relentless perpetrator of brutal barbarism, and is recognized by everyone but its own citizens as the archetypal nuclear terrorist. Nothing short of a constitutional convention which makes no compromise is needed. We compromised in 1789. Look at where we are and where we have been. We must do better, else we remain the heirs of the Soviet Union, the Third Reich, and every other tyrant we defeated.
We must do better. We must do better. Indeed. Thank you, Don Krieger, as always. And we'll see you next week, probably. <laughs> and of course, looking forward to your new book showcase. At the end of the month, Don's new book is called Discovery. Uh, next up, we have Marcella Pressure Raymond, who also will be reading in our new book showcase in the new year. So glad to have you joining us today um, from the Dakotas. Marcella. Yeah, thank you, um, Sandra and Elizabeth, uh, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Marcella Raymond, and um, I live in South Dakota. Uh, I have a couple of books on Amazon. Um, and shortly after the 2016 election, um, people around here, I live in a pretty conservative state, and people around here were saying things like, um, we have to get over this and move on. And I wrote this poem in response to that. And I'm so thrilled <laughs> that I don't have to say it all again. Um, so this is called Post-Political Meltdown. I am 60 years old. In my lifetime, my mother's lifetime, and all the lifetimes that came before, no woman has been president. Don't tell me to get over it. I have trained blonde footballers for jobs I couldn't get without a penis, jobs that paid 10 times my single mom salary. After 40 years, I still must work harder, longer, sweeter to make less. I have been the chick in the band. I am afraid to go out alone at night, to walk alone, eat alone, travel alone. I have been targeted as a child, nine months pregnant, wrinkled and old. Pedophiles picked me out at seven, again at 13. Don't tell me to let it go. I have worked since I was 14. So has my mother who worked two and sometimes three jobs until she was 70. So had my grandmother, both of them always, always still expected to keep a clean house, put dinner on the table, pay bills, keep four kids quiet. I have daughters, daughters-in-law, granddaughters, nieces, girl cousins, sisters-in-law, their world goes on unequal, unsafe, unjust, until those men are gone, you know who they are. And worse, these women and girls inherit billionaires greed and grift, international isolation in our buffoonery and worse, open, ignored, sanctioned hatred and humiliation aimed at my non-male, non-white, non-Christian, non-straight, othered friends and family, and yours too, because you have them too. The list of damages goes on and on. Don't tell me we have other work to do. I have earned this anger. Do you hear me? Don't tell me not to feel this grief, this disbelief, this loss of faith. I will open my heart and my home to those who are terrified, paralyzed, hopeless. I will get over it, let it go, move on when I can see everyone moving. Until that moment, I will keep screaming no. Thank you. Marcella Raymond, thank you for that powerful, powerful poem. Reminds me 
somewhere in my books here. Oh, up here at the top. Uh, another member from Cultivating Voices Live Poetry is the editor of Sweet, a literary confection journal. And the, the journal of the anthology is called All of Us. And you remind, your poem today reminds, as Diane's did, as so many have evoked, it's about all of us, and and though and 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 I heard that last night. I was able to listen to the speeches, and I heard Kamala and Joe Biden say things that I've never, that I've rarely heard president, uh, that I've rarely heard politicians utter in public, and uh, poets do it often to too many ears that don't hear, but I'm glad that the messages seem to be aligning. Thank you, Marcella. And we look forward to your new book showcase in the upcoming year, congratulations. And next is Kim Ports Parsons, hello. And following Kim will be Bertha Rogers. Thank you, Sandy. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, gosh, it's so much wonderful poetry. It's, it's really blowing me away. I wrote this poem um, many years ago about um, the relief you can finally feel when you're able to let something go. And in this case, it was in a very personal context. But when I was thinking about what to read today, I was thinking about this enormous ginormous sense of a weight lifting off my back and off so many backs. And there will be so much work for us to do. And there will be celebrating and, and you know, climbing the mountain. But I thought I'd share this poem called A Blessing. You sit on your porch some evening, holding the hand of someone you love or not holding it, nor your breath, nor your stiff neck of work. Your mind slowly opens with the drifting down of the dusk. Little twitches of the calendar pass through your arms and legs let them. They can't dance you back up into dailiness. Even the flashes of pain once inflicted, you brush off as you do the mosquitoes. These steel small portions of your blood don't give them more. And while you wander over yourself, and settle into the shadows. The moonflower on the vine, twining up the porch, slowly opens, slow, so slowly you don't turn your head. Let me say, I don't drag the dark tail of you behind me anymore. I have lifted you in my arms and turned you over and known your human shape once again. When I set you down, you walked away. Turn now, now that you feel some presence at your back and see the full circle of the blossom. And though momentary, how it glows how its purity washes over you, its scent, an open space in your heart. Blessings to all of you. So much to do together in the days ahead, but we have climbed over this mountain and we're gonna, we're gonna keep on going together. Love you all. Wow. Mm.
beautiful, necessary. Thank you. Um, speechless. Sometimes poems do that, of course. Thank you, Kim. Uh, much love to you back, right back at you, sister. Well, another sister of mine is Bertha Rogers. I'm glad to have Bertha joining us from upstate New York. And Bertha will be followed by Shel McDonald. Welcome, Bertha. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And it's I'm I'm moving around a little bit. I've got this new dog. <laughs> this shelter dog. <laughs> requires a certain amount of attention. <laughs> so, okay, uh, among the people who were most affected by the last four years were farmers, um, not just by floods, but by uh, those ridiculous trade agreements. So this is a poem called Work Sestina, and it's for the farmers. When at the sun's last reddening, the farmer unbends from wide and lonely fields, then relinquishes dead sickled grasses she has built into softly snaked mounds, her ancestors ponder the gift. They climb the faces of the vaulted barrows they built long ago. Shaking off the barrows yellow threads, past work of the farmer, the dead, their waists waving, climb the shorn compliant fields. Those dead pause at the mounds their descendant newly made, grasses she cut. They part and kneel in grasses, nodding at the edge of quiet barrows, their shoulders like spreading mounds streaming behind the farmer, her spent back, their shrouds scenting fields, the farmer's dead anxiously climb the evening shaft. Together they climb, their addled words parching grasses. Only the wind in the fields, the living advise. Those tending the barrows, someone calling the hungry farmer, someone breaking the mounds of the gathering. From heaped mounds, the dead harvest long strands to climb their tapestried walls. They petition the farmer to join them in the easy plating of grasses, the braiding of silk for the barrows they love. Gold, they plead, our golden fields are lush, coins adorn our brazen fields. They show the woman the mounds she made, guide her stout body toward barrows. The dead tell how to escape daily labor, climb down at last the whirling tattered grasses, believe in rest. You must leave the farmer life, crave barrows for home. You must climb down fields forever promised to mounds, grasses enfolding your face, they say, no longer farmer. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Wow, what a sustina. And then thank you for, you know, bringing the land and the people, the for forgotten people that have, you know, carried food security for us for so long. And thank you, Bertha. And to do that in a sustina, what a, what, a, what a feat. <laughs> Thanks, that, sis. Thanks, oh Sandy. Extraordinary. Well, I'm so very, very. You're muted. Myself. I'm so grateful for everyone who's joining us today, I was saying. Um, and I'm very appreciative to welcome folks who haven't read with us before yet, uh, who are members of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And, uh, and that is true of Shell McDonald. And so welcome to you. Thanks um, for joining us on this really historic day of poetry. And uh, yes, yeah, so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. 
I'm, uh, I live in Tucson, Arizona on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki. And um, I think about coming, going off of Facebook and on, but since there's art on Facebook, I keep, I stay. <laughs> so, so here you go. It's called What We Don't Count. One, the cats without laps. Two, the waves without hands. Three, the songs without singers. Four, the birds without watchers. Five, the movies without goers. Six, the jobs without workers. Seven, the seats without passengers. Eight, the candles without blowers. Nine, the jokes without laughers. Ten, the kisses without lips. Eleven, the hugs without arms. Twelve, the love without hearts. Thirteen, the troubles without shooters. Fourteen, the peace without makers. Fifteen, the elections without voters. Boy, every single one of those lines resonated with me. Every single one. Thank you. Thank you. And join us again, please, on our more traditional open mics that we have, um, where uh, we have eight readers, 10 minutes each. Usually, that's our open mics, and they're usually the first and third Sundays of the month, but sometimes we sneak in a special event here and there. Um, so encourage those of you who haven't joined us before and those of you in Facebook watching today as well to join us for our open mics. And um, certainly if you have a new book coming out anytime within a year of next spring, um, sign up, uh, contact me and we'll get you signed up for one of our new book showcase readings here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Well, there's that's my little commercial break, I guess. Uh, for the <laughs> for the day. <laughs> um, thank you again, Sean McDonald. Great to have you with us from Tucson, Arizona. And next we go over to um, Ireland for one of my salmon brothers, as I like to say. Um, Phil Lynch, thank you for being with us. It's really quite a pleasure to have you. And Patrick Lodge will be next. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, so, um... We got the news here, it was evening time yesterday, uh, so um, a long way away, as I said earlier, but um, not that far, really, despite the distance. Um, and I'm going to do, I, I, had, I wasn't sure what sort of day today would be, where we would be at, so I had thought of various things and I sort of settled on doing something and then this morning I started to write a few notes so I'm going to do something dare to do something I would never have dared to do before but it's a once off so something that I've just been even writing while, while we're talking um, it's called the morning after from my upstairs window I look across the street the early morning is bright still and quiet all is in its place where I expect it to be. Houses, gardens, hedges, flowers, grass. Little driveways where family cars are parked, in front of doors behind which other lives go on. Windows dressed in curtains, some still closed. It is November and the, the trees are almost bare, opening up a clearer view this Sunday morning. What I see could be a picture on my wall or screen, a still life image of a scene not even real, and not a view of lives I cannot see, no more than mine is visible to those across. It is a sight that for a millisecond scares with the thought of how it all could change. This snapshot of a tranquil moment in a time and place replicated in a thousand million others that will never be repeated. Like the leaf that fell onto the path just now will never grow again. 
How for many such tranquility does not exist, or if it does, it may be altered before this day is over. This thought is superseded by a feeling that what is here in front of me has changed. Although I cannot see it, though it is unspoken, it is a change I had no part in making, but one that fixes what we know was broken. Thank you, Phil. I wish I wrote once offs like that. <laughs> uh, you know, it reminds me that that's the heart of live open mics is that you can do the once off and uh, kudos to you, my friend, for, for, uh, for stepping up to the plate and also really for reminding me and I think all of us and uh, I think Patrick will probably agree about this too that um, we're, 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 we're actually so much closer than we think than that the, the, the boundaries of nations, the ocean. Uh, I like to always say that uh, when I was a little girl, I always felt like the, I live, you know, I grew up on Long Island Sound and so I saw that ocean and, and knew there were there was land across the sea. And I always thought it was so far away and that it was something that divided us. And since I've um, spent a lot of, I've been so fortunate to spend time in Ireland, I've really come to see that the ocean is what brings us together and brings us closer. So thank you, Phil. And, Thank you, Patrick Lodge up next. So glad to see you so soon after your new book showcase, your wonderful new book showcase from a few weeks ago. Uh, so glad to welcome you back. And Thanks, uh, following Sandra. Patrick will be Sarah Lally. Thank you, Sanjay. <clears throat> um, though I'm an Irish citizen, I, I live in, in uh, rural uh, Yorkshire in the UK at the moment, and we're in lockdown here. But fortunately, I'm able to get out cycling to get a bit of exercise. And I cycle through the remnants of an 18th century uh, estate, the Parlington estate, which is full of old wagon ways and lost dark tunnels. And, and that's partly the reason I'm reading this poem tonight, a 1783 triumphal arch to the victory of the Americans in the War of Independence. I believe it's the only one in the UK. But anyway, this poem I'm going to read is called The Deer in the Wood. And it starts off faintly pastoral, but uh, shifts to something else. The deer in the wood. <clears throat> I cycle shamelessly through the dark arch, little illumination in this murky sanctuary. Then burst from the tunnel, from gloom to light so bright, it must seem vast doors were flung wide open offering admission to a world agog with new minted acuity. When eyes accustomed to seeing afresh, the wagon way is an aisle, picked out in tire tread and buggy lines, leading on between the wilderness and hangings plantation. The shelter belt thins, a landscape of park, of corduroy fields expecting potatoes, discloses. Here you may pause, become a garden seer, and look where the tracks cross in the copse, a doe in a leaf shrine of fluid sanctified light. We are both motionless in this wood, posed like statues in a breeze that scatters blossom as if we were a bride and groom in union. The same path is shared. We could share too that breath which is life, except the deer is dead. Serene, as if in veneration of the view, it is spread like a rug, inviting meditation on what has been lost, what has been found. There are no futures to pledge to each other. The deer is dead, and my life flat lines ahead, 
no small purposes to diary that give the heft of expectancy to coming dates, weeks, months, that promise one day different from another. Yet this meeting, this deer in the wood, tells the eternal from the ephemeral, picks the lock. Across the fields, a hare runs, glossy in the sun. A swan beats up through the river mist into a milk-white sky. And I am still in the woods. Thank you, Sandy, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick Lodge, joining us, as you said, from the rural areas of Yorkshire and um, yet always, always invoking your Irish roots. <laughs> And, and, and uh, as I said in the new book showcase, your, your backdrop is one of my favorites. It feels like a curiosity shop to me, like looking everywhere. I always see something new. So thank you again. And uh, we'll see you again very soon, I hope. Well, next we have a trio of folks who are reading with us for the first time. And I'm so thrilled to uh, start, start off that trio of voices with um, Sarah Lally. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks. And I'd hate to be following Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is the poem that is called Ode to My Mother Deceased. Well, fuck me pink, you'd often say in that melodic twangy Connemara way. Keep on crying and I'll give you something to cry about was a sentence I'd heard often from your rosy mouth. There'll be wigs on the green, you'd shout your cheeks going red. I never doubted you could have pulled every hair from my head. A fleeting thought passed by me near as I sat in a city that you loved, but you had not known me there. Motivational posters of things you would say some in disbelief or anger or delightful glee, but in the end, I decided to keep them all for me. You'd never known me as an adult, to be honest, I don't think many have. And I wonder sometimes if that's really all bad. But sometimes I feel your presence would have taken over my life. I often think I'd probably be a mother and not just a wife, but maybe that's unfair of me. Maybe you would have been proud of your strange little girl who in her own little way took on the whole wide world, who kind of traveled the road less taken, who sits up till 5 a.m. having existential crisis after crisis, awake to the world yet asleep to the masses, who drags herself to bed as the world starts to rise, who, unsurprising to no one, easily cries. She doesn't cry for you, not really, well, sometimes. The woman in her can't fathom that she, the girl, had lived through such grief, but she did. I think you'd have been proud of how well it was handled, but probably not surprised. For I'd learned at your metaphorical apron strings how to be. A woman with depths undiscovered till it was too late to ask. A life lived before you gave me mine of pain and grief and love in your soul that till the day you died would remain untold. I love you, you'd say, as I went to bed. See you in the morning, please God, with a nod of your head. I adored you before knowing what that could mean. Hours spent watching you cook dinner or do your makeup or paint your nails. Your nails, I have the same. Not as sharp or as strong, a good metaphor for us. But someday I will take what you taught me and someone will get solace from my advice or my dirty laugh or my dazzling charm and wit, all things I inherited from you, as if you had bequeathed them to me on your deathbed. I am half of you, I am half of him, and oftentimes I am only half of me. Thank you. Wow. That's but what a beautiful poem. Thank you. Um, be sure to check out the chat. Lots of encouragement. Sarah Lally, thank you so much. I hope that you'll join us again very, very soon. 
Thank you for being a member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And next is Angela Driven, who also will be reading in the new book showcase coming up in the new year. Um, and uh, happy to have you for your first reading with us today on uh, our post-election live poetry. Open mic. Take it away, Angela, thanks. Thank you, thank y'all for having me. Um, I'm in very good poetry company. Uh, whole story. Where I'm from, we think we know okra. Buds wrapped in gossamer web, the lattice dissolves. Creamy blooms with amethyst centers expand, shed and pods grow straight towards heavens. Like tiny gods trying to make it home insist to be picked at the right moment, cooked correctly, or they'll sit slimy on tongues. Let the season stay on the branches long and linger until pods burst from the stalk. These are the ones from which to harvest seeds. One clean vertical slice, a hole split open spills out pearls. These are brought from Africa. Seeds hidden in the ears and hair of slaves. Does America grow fat on okra for the same reason it has the fortune to read January Gill O'Neill? When must love herbs with her 1,837 average likes reintroduces herself on Instagram as an expert in Appalachian food traditions, invites questions from her followers, I ask, for suggestions on research sources. And she says, I don't know, my grandparents are still living. I unfollow her. This is not good enough, unwhole, unholy. She and I set our tables with the same dishes and fractured histories and I am choking. If we name each part of the bread we break, Perhaps it can be blessed. I love what these first time readers to Cultivating Voices live poetry are bringing to us today. Um, I'm not sure I can wait for your new book showcase. So I hope you'll come and read again well before that. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, <laughs> make sure you check out in the chat. Uh, and a reminder also, um, those of you in Facebook, the chat is also very active. And so I always encourage our readers to go over into the chat in Facebook and see the comments that have been left for all of you there. Like these beautiful missives that get shared um, about your readings uh, after the fact. So thank you again, Angela, and congratulations on your new book, upcoming book, and, um, and we'll see you again very soon. Well, next, uh, if I, I believe, I'm just double checking. Yes, next we have a person I go way, way back with, we actually went to college together. Uh, so what, it's always a joy to be in the company of my dear, dear sister, Mia Hansford. Let's see if this works. Can oh, you hear me? It's Ben. I'm sorry, I skipped Ben. Okay, oh, let's God. go back, go back. Okay, we'll go back. Okay, thank you. Ben, I'm so sorry. <laughs> And this is what live poetry is all about, isn't it? Well, you got to take the, the swings. Yeah, you got to take the swings. <laughs> I'm not going to skip Ben at all. Ben, Bill Nevin says, don't skip Ben. I'm not going to skip Ben. Thank you. Um, ben is joining us. Also, as I said, uh, first time reading today. I've, I, I loved when I saw Ben pop up as a new member. Because you're also a musician, if I am not mistaken. That is correct, yeah, despite my best efforts. Yeah, so um, 
it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you and apologies again. And Mia Hansford will be up next. <laughs> thank you, Ben, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy. Uh, it's, it's great to, to read tonight. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Rising Water. I suppose it's um, sort of comment on uh, where the world's going, I guess, in some ways. Um, so, uh, Rising Water. At every point of crossing, we can see the water higher now than when we crossed before. The Shannon's banks have broken, flooding empty parking lots and mooring post where jostling river boats tread the Cayenne water. A mired dike of green and rusted pump are the future's last defense against rising water. Inside every iceberg, there's an ocean baby. We sit on the train home and it takes its time through the water world we photograph. Submerged fields, protruding fence posts still imply dominion and serve lounging rooks, but something will be lost forever. Thank you. Oh yeah. Mm. I gotta give it to you, Ben. A person that puts an iceberg in a poem is always close to my heart. I'm a bit of a titaniac, truth Thank be told. You. So Thank you. What a beautiful poem. I loved it. Striking poem. John Roche says, yes, rising water from Ben Simons. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. I hope. Come back, okay. come back. And I, I won't, and I will not skip over you again. <laughs> so glad to have you here. All right. Up next, as I've already, I've already, you know, revealed the punchline is uh, me a hands. <laughs> Followed by Gail, by Gail Heaven. Yes. Okay. Mia, hello. Unmute. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, cool. All right. This is an, oh, hey, Sandy. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, and thanks for letting me come in late. So this is so this is really rough, but I want to read it if it's okay. And I don't have a title for it, but it's from today. Or yeah, this morning. We will I don't have a title for it. We will find the children taken from their parents at the border. I don't know how, but we will find them. Deal with those holding them by law, true law that we have yet to embrace. We will dive into sweet air renewables. I will learn to ride the bike my, in my shed that Clyde left when he moved to Brooklyn. My body is unwinding the back of my arms, the front of my arms, as though a river has begun to move its sludge onward down to where its mouth empties into the sea of wakefulness, of belief that I can deal with the problems I created. It's surprising how much shame I can feel, self-shame, nation shame. Labs where the viruses grow, boardrooms where money as contract changes hands and authority as relative. These labs, these courts, these tall windowed corner offices and boardrooms. I will believe in the earth and in you. You will be real and not an apparition. I will not believe in money over you. If you tell me you're hurting, I will believe and do what the lab rat does, unlock your cage. I will evolve. I will give everything to our moment, sink my intelligence and my energy into your intelligence and energy. My fingers will do what words cannot. Find the twisted experience, let it curl into hand mind that pulls it out, lifts it without stopping skyward where the air takes it higher, dissolves it in currents, elations, equations, commands, when I want to remind someone how they fought against me, how they made sure we had no heat or some such thing, I will evolve. When grudge shows its muscle and mask, for it is a mask, I will breathe deeply into the mask, force it larger like a funhouse face, force it out like putty, be the sea monkey 
or angelfish slipping away as the putty turns into a yellow line that is even less than a current. We will find the children, put them back, pay this debt, rejoin Paris, put the roses back. We'll tax people again. Yep, we will. We will destroy the housing projects and find a different way. No one will ever again have to live in an ugly ass housing project where mothers fear for their children and can't even plant flowers in the yard. Big overwrought policemen will become farmers because they will want to. They will want the communities they didn't know before for their own lives, something better, something else. I gotta get the tires filled, undo my own laziness. But this afternoon, I will be in love with my arms, with the air, with the dancing filling up city streets. Did I say we didn't do that here? Did I say it was quiet? Did I tell you that I kept myself quiet? Still, I will savor the sunshine and walk across the river today, fill my body with the light coming off the water. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> a little rough but I'm and it needs some follow-up but I'm getting there <laughs> we're always wanting to you know we always are wanting to revise right revision <laughs> when revision is our life pulse revision uh, is our life pulse isn't it right and uh, get those words out again oh. anyway thank but, you for letting me read beautiful it's beautiful thank you and i don't know how we're going to do that i don't know how we're going to find them i thought about the i i keep thinking about those children also and uh and yeah so you know our energy our energy we put the energy there hopefully that will put something into the universe to move that process along. Yes, thank you. Wow, beautiful. Thank you guys for listening and thank you, Sandy, for all you do here. As I like to say every week, I am the greatest beneficiary of it all. So uh, uh, it, it is never lost on me every week to hear all your voices. It's a uh, it's the most tremendous gift, actually. So thank you. All right, Mia, we're going to move along from you in Chattanooga, a place I long to visit with you in person someday. And uh, we go next to another of my friends from here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Gail, having hello uh, in Tacoma, and uh, glad to have you with us. And uh, can't wait. I'm so glad you're joining us so shortly after having joined us a few weeks ago. Welcome. I think you have to unmute, please. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Sandy. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to hear the buoyancy in everyone's voices. And um, there's just a beautiful current running through everything. Very, very grateful to be part of this. Thank you. Um, Mia, uh, let's put the roses back. And it makes me think um, here in Tacoma, the poet laureate of Tacoma, Abby Murray, put together an anthology of youth who have been detained here in Tacoma. It's a bilingual anthology and it just came out, it's available um, in PDF and print on, on her website. Um, I think it's Grit City Poet Laureate, uh, Abby Murray, just a beautiful anthology in, in two languages there of, uh, of what Mia um, you know, was speaking about. Uh, this is Paper Dolls, election night. The president quietly reflects. For my father, Marty Hemmen, and everyone who's received mental health support or needed it and not had the funding or opportunity for it, Paper dolls don't need to be whole at all. And all people are just paper dolls, folding neatly stacked, one size fits all. So when not supported, one doll falls into a crisis hospital bed, needing hands 
handed invoices instead. They get a little help and back in line. They function in two dimensional time as assigned. And with family hands holding them, they do just fine. Smooth by day, smoothing over rough fold lines. At night in shame over their untold hidden times. Smooth as paper till they fold in next time. But when joined hands, joined with dollars applied, holding hands can ripple change down the line. That mental health dollars are made an investment with them, we may have even had a different president. Uh, this is for work with um, mental health youth stability in Olympia and your community youth services. Uh, my father worked in nonprofit mental health work and I hope there's a changing of the tides everybody, especially now. Uh, thank you for, for witnessing today and the opportunity, Sandy. Thank you, Gail, for lifting those voices into the room today and um, into our conscience, consciousness. Uh, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot if, 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 if the politicians would only listen to the poets, mm. what an agenda, mm -hmm. what a platform they would have for humanity. And each one of you has demonstrated that today. Um, everything from mental health, immigration, the list goes on and on. I could go into each square and name something. Um, that's not my job today to do, but, uh, but, it's, but it is all of our jobs as poets. And we, you, you all are amazing demonstrations of that of humanity. Thank you. Will Rieger is next. And again, I want to give a welcome uh, to Will as a first time uh, reader here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's, it's been great to have this combination of folks who've been with us from the early weeks, like you know, Mia and John and Bertha. And I'm gonna miss some folks. Carolyn is coming up and Indran and folks who uh, have just joined in recent weeks and are joining us for the first time. So it's such a pleasure and thank you, Will. And uh, Indran will be after Will. I can't hear Will. Will, you need right. to unmute, please. <laughs> I did. Just oh, now. you did. There you go. All the brilliant stuff I've already said. So go on. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to say that uh, because of the uh, viral issue, I was uh, forced to cancel all my public activities as a poet laureate for the city of Urbana, Illinois, and I began a program I call the Happy Gift Poem, which was I would write a poem for anyone who asked for one. And it would be, of course, a free poem on any topic they wished. And uh, I was able to complete 100 poems by the end of my tenure in, on October 31st. And this is one of them. I call it The Happener of Happenings. Under the cover of darkness, the pure love spirit fights to transcend that dim canopy. In the land of unkindness, the innocent love brings beauty back from the chaos. In the mountains of the unmade, the happener of happiness is not afraid to break through the wall in her way with a creation. She will grow rose canes to erase it to hide its ugliness and hopelessness. She walks the chillest land to decorate a life with warmth by cherishing she will redeem. A builder, love makes a home. And I, love sees possibility. A traveler, 
love has seen so much. A golden coin, love is specie for success. A nightingale, love sings away the pain. A cloud, love refracts for us the sun's light. A dandelion, love cracks the hardest stone. Maker, doer, fighter, hoper, love is not the easy path, but she will see us through. Thank you. Thank you, Will. You've gotten a lot of kudos in the chat about your project when, uh, like, as with so many of us, all of our in-person readings had evaporated so quickly. But I wanna give a little, little, little preview of something that we're working on in the, the back channels of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Um, we are working on a Poets Laureate, a Poets Laureate reading, hopefully for February. Um, and we would be inviting our members who are Poets Laureate to read. So uh, maybe put that, put that away in your um, calendar, possibly in February. We'll be putting a call out, uh, inviting our members who are Poets Laureate and be looking for announcements about that coming up. Well, next is a person who has been um, working tirelessly for months and months and I know years and years actually, but uh, I've only known him for months and months and uh, has been putting on extraordinary readings um, in support of lots of change. And there's probably no one who, I don't know, when I heard about the election, the first person I thought of was Indran Amirthanayagam because of your work. And so I'm so glad you could join us here today to share a poem. And uh, um, I've been looking forward to connecting with you um, uh, since the news. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Santi. It's, it's very hard to read after, after that introduction. It's a very sweet, what you say. I, um, I'm very, very happy. I'm, I mean, the elation is, uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot really still find the right words. Um, and, and I'm not only happy for myself, I'm happy for my, my friends among the Haitians community here in the United States. I'm happy for uh, all those who have been uh, who've come as migrants who are who've been living with this uncertainty about whether they'll be able to stay uh, legally in this country. Now they have reason to hope, and um, there are many of them. And I was one of them at one point in my life, a migrant. And and uh, you know, sort of the origins of the book that I wrote to publish this year, The Migrant States. The poem I'll read is a very new poem. It's just a draft and it's not finished by any means, but I thought I'd share it with you just because of some of the details in it. It's called Owner, Slave, Subaltern, and I'll dedicate it to Kamala. Kamala is a distant cousin, grandfather Gopalan from that regal town of Manipai and Jaffna, grandmother Rajam from Batikaloa, her father's ancestor, Hamilton Brown, Irishman, slave owner in Jamaica, slept with an unknown woman, almost certainly a slave, brought from the west coast of Africa, shackled through the middle passage. In Kabbalah's roots, rights trampled. Consideration as three-fifths of a man and two-fifths more of another. Her Tamil grandfather, subaltern in British administration, moved to a post in Chennai. We know Donald Harris moved to Berkeley to study for a PhD in economics, where he met fellow student Shyamala Gopalan, resulting in Kamala's birth. Kamala will now serve as vice president of the United States, which I represent as a diplomat migration and the dream being realized. 
how can I not write about this? I am proud that one of my people will be chief advisor and next in line to the president of this multicultural America. I'm not ashamed to refer to dark chapters in the story in this new age of truth telling, which makes us stronger, going ahead towards the dream, wearing all our colors on our body, in our mind. Thank you, that's it, appreciate it. Hi, hello, did yeah, I lose you? I have, no, you're good, wow. Okay. I have to say, last night, you know, I cried when I saw her on stage. I, I, I cried for for the journey, for the journey, and um, and her family's journey yeah. to her, to her journey is an extraordinary one. And it's the it's been the promise of this country for so so many people for so so long, mm -hmm. and people have endured incredible things in search of that, in search of that. And, and, and the country has fallen short so many times for so many people, so many times for so many people. But last, but last night, um, mm -hmm. there were so many things that were, the, the, the promise was there. Um, and so, there's a lot of work to be done, we know that, but I share with you the elation and thank you for bringing your elation and, and, and your story. And I also just wanna add that um, Indran's book, The Migrant States, Indran read in one of our early new book showcases and uh, mm -hmm. please check out um, that extraordinary collection. And I hope we'll be able to sign you up for your new book. Um, because uh, I, I love it's, I, I know that it's connected to French and I would love to have the multilingual. So let's connect about that. Thank you. And again, uh, the thing that's so beautiful about cultivating voices, I have been the amazing beneficiary of uh, developing friendships through this site that would not have likely flourished as, as, as vibrantly um, without this weekly gathering. And uh, I, I, that's no truer than this next person, uh, Carolyn Wright. And uh, I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Uh, an, another, a, another poet who has been writing about uh, humanity across the globe and uh, issues of social justice for years. And I, I remember the thrill when I saw that you were gonna read with us the very first time and the thrill has never <laughs> diminishes when you join us. No. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, <clears throat> uh, as like everybody, I'm thrilled about the outcome of the election and <clears throat> also thinking about what Indran read, you know, the uncertainties and the disruptions and dislocations that occur with people who migrate who move from one place to another and even uh, you know whether it's something that they have wished to do or something they're compelled to do forced to do it, it's very hard and in these days when we've all been closed in very much and you know going out a minimum uh just for safety against the virus um to go out to contemplate traveling long distances, even that seems oddly disruptive after we've gotten accustomed to being in. But um, what I decided to read uh, today is a poem that, well, I'm a water sign, so this poem might be appropriate. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Anima Aquatica. And it's actually going to be published very soon in a magazine called Tahoma Literary Review. And so I was recording it this morning and I thought, I'm just going to read this because I've got it practiced. And I'm a water sign, so I like, I like the soul of water, anima aquatica. 
and it's a way to build something because how can you build with you can't build structures with water but this poem wants to build a structure with water anima aquatica kingdom of water watery realm water distilled through moss and understory water under the tongue under all the stones stories of water flowing through every tongue, translucencies of water, glimmering through the forest's clerestories, suffusing sphagnum and traceries of fern, clerestories loosened as blades passing through distillation, veins of water, veins of light, veins of water passing through the light, spectral lights, spectral dominions, realms of moss along the under branches in all the waverings of water, droplets domain, realms of the water drop, clear stories reflected in the woodlands gothic uplift, high gothic vaults, groins and buttresses through which the spectral drops distill, still, venous distillations passing through water, passing through drops and rivulets, Traceries deepening the grooves, tracing the grooves into which limestone blocks are fitted. Limestone blocks repose through centuries of uplift, centuries of flight pouring through transepts and along the walls, dissolving and distilling lime from the crevices, dancing lime out from the stone. Water's glimmering domain, streaks of moss in crevices, realms of downpour sleuthing through the understory, cataracts of stone, the high vaults and transepts suffused with light, capellas and clear stories, buttresses aloft, praying in all the languages of water. Right. So that was the language that, of water. Mm. Build a, a cathedral of water in rainforest. <laughs> oh, it's extraordinary. I can see why the Tahoma Literary Review um, accepted that poem. So I look forward to looking to yeah, looking for it. All the languages of water, yeah, as Mia has written in the chat, and uh, all the languages of water. Yeah. Well, folks, we have come to our final poet, and sometimes I insert myself, and that is today. I'm going to mm -hmm. close us out with a poem and, uh, and then make a few final remarks. Uh, so I as so many of us have shared through our poems and, and our comments about our poems today, like we've just been living with such heaviness. And um, I have, you know, we went from the beautiful rhetoric, rhetoric of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, I mean, what, what eloquent people um, who, who, again, spoke about humanity to what just felt like a closed fist. I just felt like I've been inside a closed fist for four years. And so I wanted to read this next, this poem that I'm gonna share today because I felt like now the hand is opening, the hand, the fist, is opening, you know, to a hand that can be extended again. And so this poem is called The Next Open Space. You know, may we all be able to inhabit it together with, uh, with peace and love and support and, uh, and lifting everyone, uh, you know, Let's go back to water. A rising tide lifts all boats. Let's lift all the boats. 
Um, so this is the next open space. And I, I dedicate this to um, all of the readers who joined us today. We think it's about our footing, planting the fleshy parts solid to ground, taking it one step at a time, whatever it is. I try to remember this as I comfort my sisters and brothers as they migrate to spaces that feel closed before reached. I have been there outside in that dark that redefines dark without words, lifting my feet or voice impossible. And yes, it is our daily dance that offers to turn us toward the next open space, teaching us that there is so much more than what we perceive breathing under our feet, the ground rising all above us like immaculate glass cities. Look up, look up, always look up and remember this about the next open space. There is always more than one. There is always more than one. May we all move forward together in these upcoming days where we have a renewed sense of hope and um, decency and truth. That's what Kamala said last night, decency and truth. Um, I thank all of our amazing readers, our amazing poets, our um, you know, amazing, amazing people with such hearts and um, vision for sharing your words with us today on our special post-election live open mic here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's, 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 it's been quite a ride since March 29th, our first reading. And uh, we will continue on uh, through these new days into the new year with, with incredible voices uh, in our open mics and with our new books showcases, which is a reminder uh, that next week, next Sunday, I welcome you all to our first new books showcase of the month of November, where we will be featuring the new books of Hilda Raz, Betsy Scholl, Susan Eisenberg, and Leslie Allman. Uh, our next live poetry open mic will be on Sunday, November 22nd. And we will close out the month with our new book showcase featuring Jan Beatty, Don Krieger, and Lauren Russell. Uh, and we keep, we keep moving on, we keep persisting, we keep sharing our voices and uh, the poets speak. And as I said, I, uh, as I've as I've often said, uh, there's a lot of power in our voices, and may they continue to carry us through these times. Thank you all. I hope I wish you all a very very good week, and uh, stay safe. Keep taking care of your beloveds. Wear those masks, and of course. Look at what happens when we keep writing. We can man we manifest we manifest things in the world. Keep writing. And thanks for those of you who read your most um, tender new poems today. Fresh, fresh poetry. Take Thank care. You, we'll see you soon. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have everyone. a great Thank week. Have a great week.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank